This is Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we're talking with Rich Lowry, the editor of the weekly magazine version of National Review, and the author of the new book, Lincoln Unbound, How an Ambitious Young Rail Splitter Saved the American Dream and How We Can Do It Again. It's published by HarperCollins and available from Amazon.com and your local bookstore. And Rich, thanks for stopping by today. Hi, Ed. Thanks so much for having me. Rich, in addition to the Steven Spielberg movie, there have been a lot of authors recently issuing books on our 16th president. What made you decide to join their ranks? Well, I've always enjoyed and admired Lincoln, and I wanted to write this book because I really think it gets to the the why of Lincoln. It's We know so much of the story, especially during the Civil War and about the assassination, so we kind of know the, the what and the how. But this goes to his why, his, his fundamental animating purposes. And I think you don't really understand Abraham Lincoln and, unless you understand this stuff. In a nutshell, it's Lincoln as the foremost apostle of opportunity in American history, how that played out in his own life personally, how it influenced his politics uh, and his policies. It was absolutely fundamental to those things and what we can learn from it in our circumstances today. What did you learn about Lincoln while you were researching the book? Well, you're always uh, surprised by uh, um, a couple things. I, I think if you just have the, the popular image of him in your mind. One, he, he hated the, the name Abe, just hated that nickname. <laughs> and this just went to what he really sought his entire life uh, was to be respectable and to be respected. And he climbed up from literally nothing. And there was this always, from almost the very beginning, this ferocious ambition and determination um, to him. And he was able to make so much of himself also because he was exceptionally intellectually talented. So anyone who has a view of him as a common man, so-called, or uh, as an accidental president or an accidental anything in politics is absolutely wrong. And um, another thing about him, you know, we this is in the subtitle of my book, you know, we associated him with rail splitting, call him the rail splitting president. He hated splitting rails. The last thing he wanted to do in his life was split any more rails. He'd been forced to do it um, in large part uh, in his younger years, and he never wanted to do it again. And he wanted to create an America w- that wasn't based just on muscle and wrote labor anymore. He wanted to create a new country that was open to people of diverse talents who, were, um, uh, who, who would be able to make the most of themselves and not just live as subsistence farmers forevermore, which was the, the Jeffersonian, the Jacksonian vision of America. Rich, early on in Lincoln Unbound, you used the phrase, getting right with Lincoln. In recent years, it's the left that has gotten right with Lincoln, with Barack Obama in particular doing everything he can to associate himself with Lincoln in 2008 and during his inauguration. But as you note, there's a certain percentage of the right, especially paleoconservatives and some libertarians, who are rather uncomfortable with Lincoln's legacy. Why is that? Yeah, and uncomfortable um, understates it. I mean, some of them just literally hate him. Um, and then, then there's a lot of uh, just uh, discomfort with Lincoln on the right. Well, they, they associate him, I think, unfairly uh, with big government. And this goes to big arguments about a, a couple of things. One is just the, the, the roots of the Civil War and uh, the legitimacy of Southern secession. And uh, I'm just with, with James Madison on that. There wasn't a right to secede. The Constitution said nothing about it. The Constitution was not like the EU today, say, a treaty between independent sovereign uh, nations. So I think Lincoln was right about that and right to uh, to keep the country together. And two, it goes to a big argument about Lincoln's economics. And he was, uh, in the context of his day, he was an activist. You know, he wanted to um, provide government support to canals and railroads. He favored a protective uh, tariff to foster industry. And uh, he, he favored um, what some people pejoratively called government banking. Um, but all of this um, went to the, the ultimate end of creating a market cash economy uh, and a diverse economy in this country. Because when Link was growing up, and you're a farmer in the middle of nowhere, 
that was it. You couldn't sell your goods because you couldn't get them anywhere. So he, he was so eager to support canals and railroads um, that needed government support oftentimes to get off the ground because we had a very infantile financial system then, and there just wasn't the, the uh, uh, free-floating capital to support big projects like that. So it was all towards the end of creating a market economy, and I would argue had nothing to do uh, with uh, what we associate um, with the welfare state today. There were no transfer payments to individuals. There was no red tape uh, in bureaucracy. There was no regulation getting in the way of development. Uh, his vision ultimately was for um, a more developed and competitive um, economy. So I think he's uh, on the two big counts that critics on the right would lodge against him. Um, he, he is innocent. He was right to resist secession and his economics, although he can argue uh, about them, and the record you know, was legitimately um, mixed. Um, it was more, um, uh, it, it was, was nothing like a Barack Obama big government economics of today. Rich, given where you practice your day job, I have to ask you, what did William F. Buckley think of Lincoln? He was a huge admirer, um, largely as you'd expect because of the words. Um, you know, he just loved the, the Gettysburg Address and the other famous addresses. And some of the early writers at National Review, Wilmore Kendall and Frank Meyer, were Lincoln critics for some of the reasons we were just talking about. And uh, one of them, his friend Frank Meyer, uh, um, Bill Buckley wrote a letter to the editor uh, uh, of the magazine dissenting from one of his critiques of uh, Lincoln, saying he regretted it so much, and Meyer had called Lincoln an anti-humanitarian, and just Buckley recoiled uh, from this line of attack and said it was a, a blasphemy. On the flip side, self-described progressives such as Barack Obama and his supporters in the media love to claim Lincoln as their own, but progressivism as a worldview, as an ideology, wasn't quite yet established when Lincoln was actually in office, was it? Not at all. Um, I mean, it was was uh, we don't really see the rise of progressivism in America until uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Now, that does not mean that some of the associated arguments with progressivism weren't available to Lincoln. There were people then um, who hated um, corporations, who hated uh, banks, who argued you know we were uh, creating an economy that was fostering inequality and wasn't this horrible, and he just rejected um, all those arguments. And where Lincoln is different from the progressives uh, is, one, um, you know, a much more realistic appreciation of human nature, two, uh, much greater tolerance for um, inequality and letting people make their own way in the country, and three, for the way he revered the founders and believed their principles were enduring forever and weren't infinitely malleable and uh, could just be suited to to whatever government end uh, is being pursued at any given moment. So in modern terms, how would you describe Lincoln's political worldview? I would say he, uh, you know, I try to be cautious about this, Ed, because, uh, you know, obviously it's 150 years ago and you don't know how he would... uh, um, have changed and uh, how he'd view all, all the um, developments um, since his life. But if you just take him as, he, as you find him and take his statements and his basic point of view as they were then and assume no major points of view, he's much more one of us than he is um, one of them. And uh, uh, you, you just look at uh, how, again, everything to him came down to opportunity um, uh, and he, he thought our free institutions were the best guarantor of prosperity. He believed in fundamental natural rights that couldn't be violated um, by anyone. And he believed in what I, uh, what I basically call bourgeois moral norms. You know, his Whigs and then his Republicans were allied with the evangelicals of the time. And Lincoln was never a you know, Bible thumper or a moral crusader. But he was someone who believed very strongly in in the basic uh, virtues of responsibility and work and self-improvement. And um, when I, at the end of the book, try to draw some lessons from today, 
I, I latch on to that as being very important because I, I think we have a, a crisis of opportunity in this country. And it's not driven by inequality. It's driven by limited mobility, especially from the bottom of the income scale. And a lot of that uh, has to do with, with culture and social breakdown. Rich, if we're talking about Lincoln, obviously we have to discuss the Civil War. Could you talk briefly about how Lincoln was drawn into the Civil War and what he thought the consequences of it would be? Well, he, uh, you know, he um, thought he had taken an oath that he had to uphold um, uh, faithfully and execute the laws of the country. And he just viewed uh, secession as an inherently um, lawless act. And um, he you know, was confronted with an unbelievable crisis, right? I mean, you have seven states leaving the Union before he's even inaugurated. And to me... Um, as we discussed earlier, Ed, I don't think there's a right to secession in the U.S. Constitution. I do think anyone, though, has a, uh, a right to revolution. And, um, you know, the, they're uh, defenders of the Confederacy who will, will say, you know, in 1776, we seceded from uh, Britain and uh, you know, our founding fathers were secessionists. No, they weren't. They were revolutionaries. And you have a right to revolution um, if your cause is just, if your fundamental natural rights are being violated. And uh, James Madison said that. Abraham Lincoln said that. That's firmly within the American tradition. But what rights were being violated uh, in the South? Absolutely none. You know, some people point to uh, the tariff. Well, the tariff, when secession started, was at its lowest level since, I think, like 1816 or something. Now, subsequently, it went way up, but partly because Southern senators who might have been able to block it left. So it was all about slavery. So it was about violating the natural rights of others. So it was um, a lawless act, and Lincoln wanted to hold together um, the Union because he thought the Union was the best vehicle in human history for uh, the protection and the advancement of liberty, and he ended up being right. So Lincoln assumed that the Founding Fathers would have taken a rather dim view of the South's efforts to secede the Union. Absolutely. And he, you know, Lincoln's view was robustly um, nationalistic, right? He, he said that the Union existed prior to the states. Without the Union, we never would have had um, any states um, because the states didn't come to exist, into existence until after the, the Declaration of Independence. Prior to that, they were colonies with a higher sovereign above them um, in, in, the, um, in the form of Britain. Um, but he, um, you don't need to go all where he, um, you don't have to be as robustly nationalistic as he was to re- reject secession. And I would go again to, to James Madison, who said, you know, our, our Constitution was ne- neither entirely federal nor entirely national. It was a little bit of both. Part of its genius is that it spread sovereignty um, in many ways. Um, but the Constitution was not just a... Um, uh, when you signed on to it, it just wasn't a temporary measure, as he said in the letter to Alexander Hamilton. You know, you're signing into the, the signing into all of it in perpetuity, and I think that's the correct view. It's the view that um, Lincoln's kind of partisan adversary, in some ways, Andrew Jackson, took of the matter as well. And um, so I think he was right to resist secession. And if the South had gone, you would have had you know a big part of chunk of North America. Um, in a government devoted to the defense of slavery as a positive good, as an absolutely positive good, and determined to spread that system and to take more territory in Latin America and to our our southern border to create more slave territory. And um, that's a vision that um, uh, no American should want to defend. Well, in addition to settling the issue of slavery, The Civil War also decided if America would be an agrarian economy or a technological one. You spend quite a bit of time in Lincoln Unbound discussing how Lincoln was definitely in favor of modernizing America and its infrastructure. Yeah, he, he, uh, as one historian says, he didn't have a rustic bone in his body. Um, His father was a a very typical subsistence farmer, and it was a, 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 a inherently limited way of life that Lincoln wanted to um, escape almost immediately. And one of his bedrock principles in life 
is that you earn your own bread through your own toil, and then you get the right to eat that bread. You know, you get the proceeds of your labor. And before he was age 21, um, his father hired him out, made him go and do backbreaking labor, and took all the proceeds, as was his right. And Lincoln subsequently would say, in kind of a self-pitying exaggeration, but it gives you an idea of what he thought about this, I used to be a slave. And you know, there's a very uh, you know, famous um, phrase from the second inaugural where he talks about slavery as unrequited toil. I mean, that's why he thought it was wrong. It was the theft of labor. Um, anyway, he wanted to, um, as soon as he could leave home, he turned his back on this way of life. He, um, uh, he, he became friends with merchants. He opened his own store in New, New Salem, Illinois. He tried his hand at surveying. He, he was a postmaster for a while, but almost immediately he ran for office. He was age 20, 23 when he first ran for the Illinois legislature. He lost that race, but he won two years later. And uh, when he won, he won, made more money than he ever had his life through the, in his life through the uh, salary he got in the legislature. And also he was around, you know, uh, frankly, kind of a better class of, of people, although they're, they're a motley crew. But it was then that he first, um, it seems, got the idea of becoming a lawyer. And he uh, borrowed and bought books. He read day and night. And uh, he, he uh, became a lawyer. And he would make his living through his mind and through his tongue and through his ability to argue and reason. And he wanted to create an economy where not everyone was stuck in the farm um, if they didn't want to be. You know, some people wanted that way of life, which is fine. But he wanted to create other avenues uh, of advancement in America like he had forged for himself. Rich, we should probably start wrapping the interview up by placing Lincoln into a modern context. As we mentioned at the start of the interview, Barack Obama in 2008 seemed obsessed with Lincoln, and Newsweek produced a cover story that year making the comparison explicit. Given the myriad of scandals that are currently engulfing the Obama administration, though, what would Abraham Lincoln think about the arc of Barack Obama's presidency and how it currently stands? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. You know, the, the innocent explanation of the IRS stuff, which is that uh, just this is a government that uh, the president can't control and he doesn't know what's going on with it. Lincoln might have some sympathy to that, <laughs> with that because in his suspensions of habeas corpus, which are obviously highly uh, controversial, and we can get into that a little bit if you want, but um, a lot of the most um, controversial arrests that have really resounded down uh, through history and um, are ongoing embarrassments for Abraham Lincoln were undertaken by uh, generals or local officials on the ground without Lincoln's knowledge, and they had to kind of come and clean it up afterwards. So if we believe Obama's defense, Lincoln might have some um, sympathy for it. I think, though, the, the IRS matter, we are going to, we've already learned increasingly that it was coming out of Washington uh, um, from the lawyers at the IRS at Washington, and now it's just a question of how much higher it went. Barack Obama famously said early on in his administration that, quote, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism, unquote. What do you think Lincoln would have made of such postmodern sophistry? Well, it would be utterly inexplicable to him. And, you know, he, he just believed in the very marrows of his bones that this was a, a totally unique experiment in liberty and self-government, and it had to be protected at all costs. You know, and, and a lot of our, our more quote-unquote sophisticated friends you know, roll their eyes at the likes of, of Ted Cruz because he seems to take the Constitution and the founders so seriously. If you just look back at what Lincoln said about the founders, it's the most grandiose and fulsome praise you can imagine, you know, George Washington and his memory should live on in naked, deathless splendor, you know, for, for all time. Um, and he, he meant these sort of things. And, a, a, and particularly the Declaration of Independence um, was meaningful to him and a, a key element of his argument um, against, the, against the slave system. And he, he basically said, you know, the Declaration 
Um, it could have just been merely uh, a, a revolutionary document that listed all the sins of George III. Instead, it had this philosophical statement about the meaning of life and the purpose of government, you know, to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And he said the founders put that there to stick a stake in the ground and to hold us to it as a constant reminder uh, of those truths. And um, again, this is another difference between him and the progressives. He believed in natural rights that were enduring uh, for all time. And he would, um, I I believe, if if you're here now today, he'd be pointing us right back to the Declaration and to the truths and holding up everything we did to that standard and making it the test. So it sounds like Lincoln might have been a fan of the Tea Party. He certainly would have loved uh, the constitutionalism of the Tea Party and how the Tea Party harkens back uh, so uh, fondly and so intensely to the founders. He would uh, love the the vision of individual responsibility. I, I believe that he would just be appalled that we actually have government programs supporting able-bodied people who aren't working. If you look back at Lincoln's letters, he had a, a stepbrother who was back on the farm, was constantly short on cash and constantly hitting up Lincoln for loans. And if you just look at some of these letters, they're absolutely excoriating, where he just says, basically, get off your rear end and work. Get a job for cash. I'll do anything to help help you do that. But your problem right now is you're an idler, you know. And this is this is just this is a relative asking for a loan, right? It's not someone um, uh, sitting idle all day and taking a government payment, which would have been, again, just utterly unimaginable uh, to him. So, I again, I want to be cautious about reading, um, making sweeping and definitive statements about where he'd be exactly politically, but he'd certainly find a lot to admire in the Tea Party. And Rich, last question, because I have you on the line, I have to ask you about this. You were singled out for attack by Howard Dean, of all people, on MSNBC. Could you talk a bit about what brought that on and how it played out? Yeah, it was was very strange. Uh, Howard Dean was asked on Morning Joe about a column I had written about Eric Holder, basically making fun of the Attorney General, as he claimed in this Daily Beast piece that he really hadn't realized the full import of what he had done in approving um, the investigation into James Rosen until he read about it in the Washington Post. And then it dawned on him what a, a terrible problem uh, this was. And uh, uh, it, um, Dean was asked about this column and said, oh, I don't even talk about that because the you know, National Review and Rich Lowry, they're right wing nut cases. And it turned out he was very angry because we had quoted something he had said on TV a week or two earlier where he had said the whole Benghazi scandal was a laughable joke. And Dean claimed we mis- misquoted him, which we didn't, but he was obviously very, very angry. And as we've, we've learned uh, about Howard Dean, he doesn't keep his emotions under check very easily. <laughs> so there, was this, uh, there was no screaming, but there was an outburst. Well, from Abe Lincoln to Howard Dean, that's really the apogee and the perigee of American politics. This has been Ed Driscoll for PJMedia.com, and we've been talking with Rich Lowry, the editor of National Review, and the author of the new book, Lincoln Unbound, How an Ambitious Young Rail Splitter Saved the American Dream and How We Can Do It Again. It's published by HarperCollins and available from Amazon.com and your local bookstore. And Rich, thanks for stopping by today. Hey, thanks so much, Ed. I enjoyed it.